so we're just going to spend uh, this one um, adult Sunday school class on uh, Confucianism and Taoism in China. We've talked a lot about Buddhism, and Buddhism, of course, uh, really um, took root in China. And you'll see on the back of, of your handout, we've got here this, this picture that I just pulled from the internet of... Um, uh, the Buddha, uh, you know, Siddhartha, Gautama, uh, and then we've got uh, Confucius, and then we've got uh, Lao Tzu, who is um, the kind of great figure of Taoism. Uh, I should say before we get started, you all know, have probably heard this story, that when, when I uh, got to Radford University for undergraduate, I had a um, uh, roommate uh, in my dorm who had just arrived from China, right? So he, he was, um, I, I think he'd just gotten off the plane like the day before or something like that. Uh, and uh, his name was Yin Dong, and uh, I've told you all before that for 15 minutes he tried to explain to me how to properly pronounce his name, Yin Dong, uh, and uh, eventually he said, well, just call me Tony. Uh, so, <laughs> apparently, I wasn't getting the, the, the right, uh, you know, inflection in my voice when I was saying it, so I'm sure that I'm going to mispronounce uh, these words, and, uh, and, you know, what, what can you do? But I'll do my best. You won't know. Right. You won't know. What I'm really worried about is since this is on Facebook Live, there might be somebody who will know <laughs> and they'll see it. And, uh, we'll forgive you. Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll forgive me. Yeah. That's good. Uh, all right. So um, we've got this picture on the back of, of these three, uh, you know, religious figures or uh, important figures of what is sometimes called the Three Doctrines in China. Uh, and uh, and this, there's a, it, this picture reminds me of a, a similar picture, which is uh, sometimes called the vinegar tasting picture, where you have uh, three men gathered around a vat of vinegar and, and uh, for, I think, used for pickling or something like that. And, the one that tastes it and says, oh, it's, it's too, too bitter, uh, you know, we've got to fix it. Uh, another tastes it and says, uh, it is too bitter, but, uh, but, you know, we just have to uh, not worry about that kind of, that's not what we should focus on. And then the third uh, tastes it and says that it's, it is, too bitter and it tastes great, right? And uh, the first is supposed to be the Confucian who, who uh, sees the problem and wants to fix it. The second is the Buddhist who sees the problem uh, but thinks, you know, he tries to uh, cultivate uh, a mind of equanimity so he, he doesn't want to pass judgment on it. And the third is the Taoist who uh, sees uh, the problem, but recognizes it's not a problem, it's just the way it is, and, uh, and the problem is with himself. So that, that's supposed to be a kind of overview of these three doctrines. Since we've already talked a lot about, uh, as I said, Buddhism, we'll focus now on Confucianism and, and Taoism in China. So part of the trouble is, um, in, in trying to disentangle these, uh, is that uh, they use the same words, obviously, because they're using the, the, you know, the same language, and they use some of the same concepts. And in fact, um, you find uh, in um, burials uh, of texts, uh, Confucian, you know, ancient burials of texts, uh, Confucian and Taoist texts, what we would now call Confucian and Taoist texts, buried together. So they're, they're often, uh, the two are often 
uh, not necessarily in opposition to each other, but um, but often used interchangeably. Uh, but there are differences, and so we'll focus on the differences. Some of the shared concepts, well, most importantly, is is the Tao, uh, which is uh, often translated as uh, the way. This is the way of heaven, uh, or the way of nature. Um, for much of Confucianism, this is uh, a more mundane, more prosaic kind of. This is just the you know the structure of things. This is the way things go. For for Taoists, it often takes on a, a deeper meaning, a much deeper meaning, uh, as in something like. Uh, the, the very grain of the universe, and we, we talked about uh, a similar concept uh, in Hinduism, but, but not just the way things are, but the deep down way things are. Uh, and that's uh, in some ways shrouded in mystery, but that you want to align yourself with. Um, another important concept, and of course, you know, because we have so little time, I'm not giving this uh, the, really the, the time that it's due by a long stretch. But another important concept is um, what's sometimes pronounced here in the West is yin-yang. Uh, I think the closer pronunciation to, to how it actually is is uh, in-yong, in uh, in uh, the balance of opposites, heaven and earth. You see the the symbol there. Um, and uh, these are not necessarily, even though they're opposites, they're again not, not necessarily opposing but complementary. Uh, again, the, the, the Tao would be when, when they, when uh, yin and yang complement one another. Right? That's the way not when they're in opposition. Uh, another important concept that's shared uh, is that of qi. Uh, and this is the vital force in, uh, in things, in people, in plants, in animals. Uh, uh, even perhaps uh, the um, inanimate uh, and inorganic is, is an expression of qi. Uh, but just chi on a lower rung, you might say. Um, and, and of course, you might recognize uh, that word from the uh, kind of exercise or martial art known as tai chi, right? which is which is all about uh, getting your chi flowing through the meridians of the body. Uh, and so you do these things because they're going to to help you uh, balance and direct your chi, these movements, this exercise. Uh, and then uh, chin, which is heart or mind. Uh, so, of course, we, we typically uh, will um, set heart and mind in opposition, right? We think of heart as being related to feelings, mind as being related to cold rationality, and these two are, uh, you know, often at odds, especially in pop love songs or poems uh, for us. But uh, Chin is, is heart and mind together. Together. There, there's not the opposition. Uh, and the final thing, um, you know, there's actually more that we could talk about, but the final thing we're, go we're going to talk about this morning, the uh, Confucianism and Taoism and, and really just uh, uh, Chinese culture altogether holds in common is ancestor veneration. Uh, both the, um, your personal family's ancestral line, you want to venerate, uh, those who have come before you, you know, your great grandparents and, and so on, uh, but also the um, society's ancestral line, the, 
important uh, kings who have come uh, and emperors who have come before uh, the, in some of the kind of um, more mythic stories, the, uh, these characters who, uh, for example, first, the, I forget his name, but the, the great ancestor who first uh, convinced men to come down out of the trees and live on the ground. Uh, or um, the one who, uh, when, when the great flood came, dug the canals. Uh, and, and use the floodwaters to irrigate and so on. You, you venerate all of these folks and the veneration, the rituals of veneration uh, include things like, um, you know, uh, sacrifices of food at home altars and at temples for your ancestors. Uh, and this is, this is something that Confucians and Taoists and really just anybody would do. Uh, and uh, and uh, in, in the past, um, I don't think now, but, but in the past, sacrifices of animals also. So there's a, um, a saying in the uh, Analects where one of uh, Confucius's disciples wants to um, Kind of anticipating maybe the coming of Buddhism because Confucius uh, lived before Buddhism uh, came to um, China. But kind of anticipating the coming of Buddhism, one of Confucius's disciples says, "Well, let's not sacrifice the animal." And Confucius says to him, uh, "You love the animal. I love the ritual." Right, so the, the better thing is to love the ritual and, and to, to sacrifice the animal is, is an honor, not, not, uh, not something bad for the animal. A point where, of course, Buddhism would disagree with, uh, with Confucius. Don't ask the animal. Don't ask, you think the animal would probably be Buddhist about it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, and there's lots of rituals uh, involving the ancestors, but also involving your living relatives and, and such, uh, and society. Um, so one thing, of course, that we should be aware of is that uh, Confucius and the ancient Chinese had never read Thomas Jefferson, so uh, they, they weren't talking about separation of church and state. Uh, and um, and so it's, uh, all of this is mixed together, uh, political uh, and religious. Um, the distinctions that we would make are not made by these folks. Uh, so let's, let's talk for, about Confucianism. Uh, Confucius, uh, that's the Latinized form of the name Confuci. Uh, uh, which means Master Kong, uh, and uh, I'm just going to call him Confucius. Uh, and he lived from uh, around 551 uh, to 479 BC, uh, thereabouts. Uh, and um, he actually didn't make a big splash in his lifetime. Uh, he had disciples, he taught. But uh, he really wanted, it seems, to be an advisor of a great king uh, who would put his principles into practice. And that never, never seemed to happen. Uh, I'm reminded, actually, of, of Machiavelli, because uh, Machiavelli wanted the same thing. He wanted to, to be uh, an advisor uh, of state. And, uh, the Prince, which he wrote, which is, uh, if somebody's read something by Machiavelli, it's usually The Prince, was like a, you know, like a little bit of a resume. It's, uh, it was his attempt to convince, uh, I think, the Medici Prince to hire him, essentially, as his advisor. Uh, he, he wrote it, uh, but it didn't work out for him. So, just like, uh, 
in his own lifetime, Machiavelli probably didn't get the, uh, the respect he deserved, but afterwards, uh, you know, every uh, first year political science major has to read his work in college now. Same with Confucius, in his own lifetime, he didn't really uh, uh, achieve the kind of influence that he hoped to wield, but now, uh, in the centuries and the millennia since then, uh, he has uh, become, uh, you know, way more influential than he probably could have ever expected. Uh, I mean, Confucian values are still um, just baked into uh, Chinese culture. Uh, so, there are Confucian scriptures, um, if we want to call them scriptures, uh, and that's a, that's a debate we could have, uh, but there are certain texts that are, in a sense, canonical, canonical because these are the texts that um, different uh, Chinese empires and kingdoms have held up as these are the ones that, uh, that should be read. Um, and we'll just kind of go through the, there's two sets. The first set is the five classics. So this is the traditional set of, of Confucian scriptures. Uh, the Xu Jing, the Xi Jing, the Li Ji, and the Chun Xu, and the Yi Jing. Uh, the Book of History, the Book of Poetry, the Book of Rites or Rituals, uh, the Spring and Autumn Annals, and the Book of Changes. The Book of History, I think uh, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It talks about uh, historical matters. The Book of Poetry, uh, also self-explanatory. The Book of Rites, this deals with those uh, rites and rituals and ceremonies, both of state and uh, personal uh, veneration of ancestors and such. Uh, the spring and autumn annals have to do with uh, the um, seasons of Lu, the province where uh, Confucius uh, lived most of his life. And uh, there was another, there was a book of music, but that's been lost. Uh, and then, of course, the one that everybody knows the Yi Jing, um, or uh, as, as an American might say, the A Ching. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this is, uh, this is a book that actually predates Confucius, uh, and um, is uh, really a book of divination. So it tells you uh, how to um, do uh, kind of, I, I forget how they originally did it, but it, eventually they did this divination with coins, how you throw the coins, and the patterns that they make, and then if you, and you can go buy the Yi Jing at Barnes & Noble or whatever, uh, it will give you uh, a description of what the patterns mean, and that's supposed to kind of tell you how you should act, what you should do. Uh, and um, I, I, don't, I don't want to be disrespectful, but if you read it, it sounds kind of like a fortune cookie, right? So it doesn't tell you, go marry this guy instead of that guy, or you should take this job instead of that job. It, it has these much more kind of poetic and generic kind of sayings that then you have to further interpret based on the question that you're asking, based on the decision you're trying to make. Uh, so um, why is that one so popular in the West when the others you can't find? I, it's hard to say. Um, I do know that in the 1960s, someone asked Bob Dylan what his favorite book was, and he said, I only read one book, the E. Jane. 
And after that, sales of the Yi Jing went up, like <laughs> shot up in the West, and so all over America. So anyway, uh, for whatever reason, this has become uh, a very popular book. Like I said, though, it actually predates Confucius. So the fact that it's considered one of the five Confucian classics is interesting because it, it, it really does not connect with Confucius and his teachings. Well, there was a guy, uh, Chu Si, I know I'm mispronouncing that, who lived from 1130 to 1200 uh, AD, uh, and he was a, a Neo-Confucian, and he said the five classics are not a, um, not a good entryway into uh, learning uh, Confucianism. And he suggested instead the four books. And the four books are, are actually supplements to the five classics. Uh, and the first one is uh, Lun Yu, the Analytics, uh, might better be translated as the Conversations. And this is, uh, you can see a little book, and it, and it just gives uh, what um, ancient Greek scholars would call Kreia. Uh, of these little kind of vignettes of on this occasion Confucius said this and on that occasion Confucius said that and so uh, it's because of this book I, I suspect that uh, you have those uh, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps racist uh, jokes that begin Confucius said because uh, so much of the analytic uh, the analects begin with Confucius said this, uh, or Confucius said that. But if you really want to understand uh, Confucius, Confucius and his teachings, this is the place to start. Uh, that was Xu uh perspective, and I think uh, most people would say he was right about that. This is a good place to really understand Confucius and his teachings. Um, there, there were a few other of these books, and I, I suspect that if I, um, if I try and pronounce their names, I'm just going to make a fool of myself. Uh, but the English translations of their names are The Great Learning, The Constant Mean. Again, this is mean as in like Aristotle's The Golden Mean, right? This is the, the balance of yin and yang. Uh, and... Um, so it's talking about how to how to produce that in your life and in your relationships, uh, and then the um, the Mingzi, uh, or the, which is the teachings of Mingzi, or of uh, his Latinized name is Mencius, uh, who is another Confucian. Central to how are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hurry up and get through uh, Confucianism so we can spend a little bit of time with Taoism. So central to uh, Confucianism is uh, this focus on our relationships. So Confucianism does not focus on going inward and thinking about your inner spirit or anything like that. It's focused on your relationships and uh, Confucius recognizes five basic social relationships. That of father to son, that of elder brother to younger brother. And these are always the first one named is the one who in a sense has authority over the other and that the other is meant to do, uh, you know, pay homage to or, or, or re to respect. So father, son, elder brother, younger brother, husband, wife, uh, Friend to friend, uh, and um, much like Aristotle, he says, uh, Confucius says, a friend needs to be somebody on the same level as you, where they can't really be your friend at the same social level. Uh, but this number, this, this fourth relation is sometimes presented as friend to friend, and sometimes in, in some of the writings it's presented as any elder person in society uh, to any younger person of the same gender. Uh, and then the fifth is uh, the ruler 
to the ruler subject. Uh, and these are all pretty, what we might think of as pretty conservative kind of sense of, um, of these, uh, you know, relationships. Uh, it's the kind of thing where you think you could probably be summed up in, uh, you know, respect your elders. Uh, I feel like this is the kind of thing that would actually work well in the South where, where you know, you're taught to say yes ma'am and yes sir, uh, right? Uh, anyway, all of these uh, relationships, kind of living into them uh, in the way that you are supposed to is following the Tao for Confucianism. That's the way. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, Shu Xi. <coughs> The only other thing that I want to say about him, he's the one who chose the four, bu four books over the five classics. Um, the other thing that he did was he came up with, now he's living in China at a time when Buddhism's already well established there. And remember that the Buddhist doctrine of, uh, of emptiness is that not all things are empty, essentially. They have no essential essence, right? That might be redundant, essential essence, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, he countered that uh, and said, no, everything is, is essentially a combination of chi, this vital force, which can even take the form of matter uh, when, on, on the lower levels, uh, and li, which is a, a rational principle or a law. Uh, and there's, there is a law or a rational principle running through all things. In human beings, it's the mind, right? Uh, and that this is what uh, gives shape to or gives form to the chi. Now this is actually, I, I find really interesting because this is very similar to uh, the way that Aristotle talks about um, form and substance. But, uh, but we can get into that because we've got to move on to Taoism. All right. So Taoism, uh, Taoism is attributed to uh, Lao Tzu, who is uh, this guy here, the older guy in the picture. Uh, and that name is actually just a word that means uh, old master. Although in fact, it, it could be the way that uh, the characters are written, it could, could just as easily be plural, old masters. Uh, most modern historians do not think that this was an historical person. I mean, one is that's not really a name. Uh, but two, there's no records anywhere around his own supposed lifetime that mention him. So he's only mentioned much, much later. Uh, and uh, He's the one who's credited with writing the Tao Te Ching. Uh, and yet we know that the Tao Te Ching uh, emerged over a period of time and it grew over a period of time. So it wasn't just written by one person. Uh, but the story is that he lived somewhere around 600 to sometime around 500 BC. So he was may be contemporaneous if he actually existed with um, Confucius. Uh, he did have a big impact, uh, according to the stories, on society. People recognized him as a wise man and, and um, sought his teachings. Uh, and then before he died, he left to go to the West. And uh, just as he was leaving to, to kind of uh, right off into sunset, uh, he was asked to write down his teachings, and that's the Tao Te Ching. Uh, of course, that's not what really happened, uh, but that's the story. And even some later Taoists would wanted to claim that when he went to the West, what he actually did was he went over uh, to India. Uh, and 
he taught uh, a simplified version of Taoism to the Indians because they couldn't, the, the, you know, the Indian as in the inhabitants of India, because they, they, they couldn't, they weren't prepared to receive the full teaching of Taoism. Uh, so he taught them a very simplified, watered-down version, uh, and that was Buddhism. So he was actually the Buddha, right? Uh, well, obviously Buddhists don't accept that, but uh, uh, that was a way of kind of trying to in incorporate this foreign religion into uh, Chinese culture. Uh, sorry, so the Tao Te Ching, which is supposedly written by, Le, by Lao Tzu, uh, is uh, also pretty short uh, and, um, and quick and easy read, uh, though, um, you know, you're not supposed to read it quickly. You're supposed to, to kind of mull over the text, read it slowly and, you know, read it over and over again. Um, and... Uh, and it's, uh, like I said, it developed over time, and it's actually in two parts, uh, though you won't see the division in most translations that you get. The first 37 chapters are the, the Tao Jing, and the, uh, then chapters 38 to 81 are the Di Jing. And uh, the Tao Jing is directed more towards individuals, and, uh, and is about... Uh, developing your own uh, kind of spirituality and virtue and, and stuff as an individual. The Dijing is uh, directed towards um, rulers and officials and it has much more to do with how to manage people and how to rule and that kind of thing. Uh, so for example, uh, chapter 80 is, uh, this is from the Dijing, a small country has fewer people, though there are machines that can work 10 to 100 times faster than man, they are not needed. The people take death seriously and do not travel far. Though they have boats and carriages, no one uses them. Though they have armor and weapons, no one displays them. Men return to the knotting of rope in place of writing. Their food is plain and good, their clothes fine but simple, their homes secure. They are happy in their ways, though they live within sight of their neighbors, and crowing cocks and barking dogs are heard across the way, yet they leave each other in peace while they grow old and die. So, uh, we, we've got to wrap it up, okay. So, okay. so anyway, the, the point is, is that uh, this is what you want. You want a small country where, where, where you keep, keep things small. It sounds a lot like the, sh the Shire from The Hobbit, right? Um, all right. I'd love to read some more to you, but we don't have the time. Uh, I'm sure Jeanette, uh, if, if you ask her to, she's got her own copy over there. We'll read you some during coffee hour. Uh, but let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, the, um, there's another important uh, person in the history of Taoism. That's Shuang uh, Si. Who, Master Shuang, who lived from 369 to 286 BC. Uh, and uh, his, there's a book by, uh, of the same name as him. Uh, he only wrote the first seven chapters, the whole rest of it were added on later. Uh, and he actually lived before there was anything like Taoism as, as, a, as a sense of. Um, you know, this is this is something uh, organized and that kind of. So he may not have even considered himself a Taoist, and he may not have known that term. Uh, and I've got a couple things on here about stories about him, but I'll have to leave those for another time. Uh, but really, the Tao Te Ching is just one little text, and and in fact, Taoism has hundreds of texts, and the most important are called the Tao Zong. Uh, these are split into three, the Cavern of, of Perfection, which is 34 texts, the Cavern of Mystery, which is 27 texts, the Cavern of Spirit, which is four texts. We can't get into any of that because we're running out of time or have already run out of time. So I'll leave that there. An important concept in Taoism 
is wu wei or uh, nothing doing or no, no action or non-action. The idea here uh, for both individuals and for rulers is the less you do, the more you are in the way of nature, the Tao, uh, and you accomplish the things that you need to accomplish without having to exert effort. If you're exerting effort, then you're actually working against the grain, you're working against the Tao. Uh, and again, Taoism has priests who engage in rituals of worship of deities, veneration of ancestors, prayer, meditation, exorcism, that kind of stuff. I'm sorry that we've got to wrap it up, but we did. Good. Great summary.